Welcome to our worship today on Trinity Sunday from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar. Our thanks today go to Jess Hebe for our first reading and to the choristers of St Martin in the Fields for our two hymns. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus you are Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life 
and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Our psalm today is Psalm 29. Bring unto the Lord, O ye mighty, bring young rams unto the Lord. Ascribe unto the Lord worship and strength. Give the Lord the honour due, due unto his name. Worship the Lord with holy worship. It is the Lord that commandeth the waters. It is the glorious God that maketh the thunder. It is the Lord that ruleth the sea. The voice of the Lord is mighty in operation. The voice of the Lord is a glorious voice. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedar trees. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Libanus. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Libanus also and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. Yea, the Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to bring forth young, and discovereth the thick bushes. In his temple doth every man speak of his honour. The Lord sitteth above the water flood, and the Lord remaineth a king for ever. The Lord shall give strength unto his people. The Lord shall give his people the blessing of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke, and I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We say the Magnificat together. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath holpen his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, 
is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Today's Gospel reading comes from John chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, We speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We say the Nunc Dimittis together. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come, to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people 
and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who hast given unto us thy servants grace, by the confession of a true faith, to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity, and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. We beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith, and evermore defend us from all adversities, who livest and reignest one God, world without end. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Be afraid, be very afraid. That line came into my head as I read our readings for today, but I couldn't remember where it came from, so I had to look it up. It turns out it's from David Cronenberg's 1986 film, The Fly, which is based on a short story by George Langelan about a man who's half turned into a fly in a botched scientific experiment, at which point it all came back to me. I've never seen the film, but I did read the story many years ago, and I've always wished I hadn't. I was indeed afraid, very afraid. Fear is a strange thing. Logically, you'd think we'd all want to avoid it. And yet we seem to be drawn to scary experiences, whether it's reading or watching a horror story or going on a scary ride in a theme park. Of course, in those situations, the fear is tamed by the knowledge that the story is made up and the scary ride has, we hope, been thoroughly inspected by the health and safety officials. Perhaps we need to play act our fears so we're ready for the real thing. But perhaps also we know that sometimes frightening experiences can be important, a gateway to something new, a moment of growth. In our readings today, we meet two frightened men who discover exactly that. The prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament stands in the temple in Jerusalem, where God was believed to be present at the heart of Israel. It was a very familiar place to Isaiah, but on this day something very strange was happening there. Isaiah had a vision of God, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Around him were mysterious beings, seraphim, flying with their six wings and singing to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. It wasn't just a cry of worship, it was also a warning. The Israelites believed that getting too close to real holiness was dangerous, not because God meant anyone evil, but simply because encountering him was life-changing. Isaiah was rightly terrified, realising how small he was in comparison to this mighty God. What business had he even to be there? in this place where heaven seemed to have invaded earth. But as he wonderfully discovered, not only did God want him there, God even seemed to need him. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? cries God. And Isaiah answers, Here I am, send me. The Hebrew scriptures said that no one could see God and live. And although there were those like Isaiah and Moses who did, they were never the same again. They found themselves on pathways they could never have imagined. 
so maybe there was death of a sort going on. The fear in the Gospel reading is less obvious, but I think it's just as real. Nicodemus is afraid of what others will think of him, a respected senior religious leader who's supposed to know what's what. That's why he comes by night, as the story tells us. Why would he want to talk to this radical preacher, Jesus, just a carpenter from Nazareth, who's been upsetting the traditional order? But I think if he's afraid of the opinions of others, he's also, and maybe even more, afraid of himself and his own feelings. He senses that there's something about Jesus that feels like the presence of God, something of that holiness which so frightened Isaiah. Nicodemus can't understand or explain it. Jesus has no training, no background, no standing in society. But he can't deny it either. And he knows that if Jesus really is from God, of God, maybe even the Messiah, it will have huge consequences for him, upending his life. We're not told what happens at the end of his conversation with Jesus, but it's clear that he doesn't drop everything and follow him, not yet at any rate. He seems just to slip back into the darkness he arrived in. It's all too scary. He isn't mentioned again until after the crucifixion, when he finally steps out of the shadows and helps to bury Jesus' body. But I think we can assume that he must then have become a disciple, and part of the early church. Otherwise, his name and his story wouldn't ever have been known or recorded. Fear, as I said earlier, is a strange thing. It can be a horrible experience, something dark and destructive, which crushes our spirits and makes us shrink from life. But there are also times when we feel the kind of holy fear which Isaiah and Nicodemus felt, Times when our fear is a sign that something is happening that really matters. When we realise we're encountering something bigger and more mysterious than we are. When we discover that we're standing on holy ground, being drawn into the life of God, into his holy work. I recall coming home from hospital with my first child and finding myself entirely alone with this tiny, fragile, brand new human being, knowing that his safety and happiness lay in my hands, and he didn't even seem to have come with a manual. A small child, but a huge responsibility and a huge privilege, which I knew I didn't have the resources to handle, because none of us does. I was rightly afraid, but looking back, I can see that it was a holy fear, a good fear, and I'm glad to have felt it. I recall the time, too, when I battled with the sense that I was being called to ordained ministry, something which felt impossible to walk away from. I knew that saying yes to God would have consequences for me and those around me, though, and I knew that I couldn't possibly do it in my own strength. In the ordination service, priests are told that the treasure now to be entrusted to you is Christ's own flock, bought by the shedding of his blood on the cross. There was no way that I felt that I was up to such a precious job, and that's still the case. It's only by the grace of God that I'm here. The day I stop being aware of that holy fear, the privilege that's been entrusted to me, is the day I need to give up. I'm sure there have been moments in all our lives like that when we quake a bit, knowing that we're doing something or making some decision that really matters. I've often stood at the top of the chancel steps and watched couples tremble as they say their marriage vows, as the nerves about the practicalities of the day give way to the proper holy fear at the scale of the promises they're making to love and to cherish till death us do part. If they weren't at least a bit frightened at that point, I think I'd be worried for them. Chronic anxiety, of course, is a terrible thing and needs professional help to address. But a life in which there's no fear is no life at all, because it means there's no growth, no challenge, 
no point at which we are called out beyond our comfort zone, knowing that we're doing something that really matters simply by being ourselves. What those callings look like will be different for each of us, and they'll change throughout our lives. Our fears will be different too. But if we can face them and acknowledge them to God, we too can find ourselves in the Holy of Holies with Isaiah, as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit weave themselves into our lives and lead us into true joy. Amen. Let us pray. Trinity of love, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you call us into your presence. Help us to trust your love for us and for all people, so that we can come boldly to you and know ourselves to have come home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trinity of love, we pray for all who feel alone and unloved today, to all who feel overlooked or left behind, treated as if they did not matter or discounted by those who hold power. We pray especially for those who suffer discrimination and oppression. Open our eyes to our own prejudice, our ears to the voices of those we don't listen to, our hearts to the knowledge that all people are equal in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trinity of love, we thank you for those who show us love, echoing your love for us, for family and friends, for those who have gone beyond the call of duty to care for neighbours. Help us to embody your love in the places you have called us to, so that all will know it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trinity of love, we pray for all who are sick or sorrowing today. We ask you to comfort and strengthen them. We bring before you any who are known to us and those who are known to you alone in a moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trinity of love, we thank you for your promise that in life and in death, we are enfolded in your love, and we pray for all who have died, entrusting them into your keeping. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, in the words of the 17th century Bishop Thomas Ken, to God the Father, who first loved us and made us accepted in the Beloved, to God the Son, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. To God the Holy Ghost, who sheddeth the love of God abroad in our hearts. To the one true God, be all love and all glory for time and for eternity. Amen. The peace of God that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.